case studies in empirical medical ethics. Can we test what is the right thing to do? So what do I mean by this? And what do you have in store for you for the next hour? Well, I told you my name was Zoe Fritz, but I didn't tell you what I do. I am a doctor. I work in acute medicine at Adam Brooks Hospital. And most of the questions I ask and the things I think about are done through the prism of clinical practice. How can we make things better for our patients? How can we improve their outcomes? How can we improve their experience? Um, and I am also an ethicist. I'm a welcome fellow in society and ethics. And what do I mean by ethics? Well, I think very, very broadly, I want to know what is the right thing to do. And obviously, what is the right thing to do can be different according to different people and different people's standards. So we need to think a little bit more nuanced, what is the right thing to do and by whose standards. And I'm also an academic, um, I am obviously a Cambridge alumna, and uh, I was therefore taught the scientific method and that scientific research helps us answer questions, but how can we apply the scientific method to ethical questions? And in particular, in order to do that, we need to think about what kinds of things can and importantly should be measured, because clearly there are things you can measure that are irrelevant. And even if we can measure them, what can be proved by measuring them? So it's very straightforward uh, to measure how well an antibiotic is working. We can give an antibiotic. We can then assess whether the bacteria is killed. We can do that in a patient. We can see if they get better and we can then prove that this antibiotic works. We can even prove that it works better than another antibiotic. But when you try and apply scientific research to ethical questions, there may be, it may be harder to assess what can and should be measured. Um, and I'm interested in this interface, in this Venn diagram of where scientific research can be used to try and assess what is the right thing to do. And I think that there are some of those things which then can direct a third circle of the Venn diagram, which is policy, because ideally health policy, both at a governmental level and at local level, should be helping us do the right thing. And so if we can gather enough evidence to propose or even to mandate change in policy in order to be able to say this is the right thing to do, um, and these are the societal and political drivers for change, then we have a really interesting, an interesting way of trying to make health, health policy and health practice a bit better. So in this talk, I'm going to look at all of these three circles. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a way of involving philosophy and ethics in, in terms of being able to guide policy. And then in the second half of the lecture, I'm going to go into more depth into one particular case study of how these things have interfaced uh, and how I've worked with my colleagues to try and achieve some change. So a lot of people are very skeptical that we can use the scientific method to test what is the right thing to do or what is good. Um, and this idea of can we test what is good is a reasonable question to ask. So the first thing is what is empirically good? Well, I gave an example with the antibiotics in the first place. I think we can all say that if we are curing a disease, that is probably empirically good. And you could probably say that it is empirically good to reduce the resource needed to cure the disease. I think there wouldn't be very much debate about that, and we'll, we'll come back to that again in a second. It's harder to determine what is ethically good, particularly when it's related to behaviours, because clearly behaviours vary according to the person exhibiting the behavior, according to the person experiencing the behavior, according to, according to the context. So if we take an example that I've looked at, um, could you say it is always right to disclose information to a patient about um, the fact that you are withholding, you are not doing a particular investigation? And you would have some people who are saying that that isn't, and some people who are saying it is. How can you establish a framework for when it is ethically good? Um, the other issue is, that's tricky about ethics is that when you are assessing whether something is empirically good, if we go back to my antibiotic example, you can say this is empirically good because it cures the disease and you would always be very careful to check for side effects. So you may give the antibiotic, it may cure disease, but if it causes lots of renal failure, then it's not so good. So you've got to always check for the side effects and in ethics, it's the same. If you've got an intervention, even if it is having the positive effect and making something good, if it's having a negative consequence and unintended effect, and you need to consider those. So whenever you're asking an ethical question, if you want to test whether it's good, you need to not only look at the intended consequences, but also be very careful to consider what unintended consequences there might be and measure those. So what tools do we have at our disposal to test what is good? 
Well, we have qualitative research. So that is to assess current behaviors, perspectives and interactions of all the users. Um, that might be, for example, ethnography, which is observing how people uh, provide certain treatments or how people interact with patients or any set of the things that goes on, even things we haven't even thought about looking for, you can find out by ethnography. And you can do interviews, which is obviously reported behavior, but it's nevertheless very helpful to know, for example, what doctors find uncomfortable about their practice or what patients really hate. And then you can add an intervention and you can repeat the ethnography or repeat the intervention, repeat the interviews in order to see how that intervention might have changed things. You can do some quantitative research. As I said at the introduction, you have to be very careful to choose what you're measuring. You have to choose relevant measurable outcomes and what influences them. But, and we'll come up, we'll come up, we'll come up to looking in a second about what kind of outcomes might be useful. But quantitative research can definitely be used to look at ethical outcomes. On a bigger scale, you can do policy evaluations and health economics analysis. Health economics analysis is important for the kind of thing I was talking about in terms of unintended consequences, if you're paying for one new intervention, um, then almost certainly there's less money in the closed pot for paying for something else. So what is the impact of that? It's called opportunity costs. If you're doing one thing and you're not doing something else, um, and, or are there savings in doing this? Are you actually managing to save money in some way? Um, and finally, there's case law review. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into this in, in detail today, but we're doing a project at the moment, which is really interesting. Um, and, and law and ethics uh, nudge each other along and aren't always in harmony. But when you look at law review, when you look at the kind of things that have led to litigation or led to human rights questions, they sometimes then need you to say, actually, we should be challenging the ethical practice as well it's useful to look over a, a series of case law review and say what are the things that are being challenged. So these are the tools at our disposal. Um, Jeremy Bentham, who I think was an Oxford alumnus rather than a, a Cambridge alumnus, didn't seem, obviously some time ago, that confident that questions of ultimate ends, in other words what is good, was amenable to direct proof. However, luckily, he did say whatever can be proved to be good must be so by being shown to be a means to something admitted to be good without proof. So the question then to me, I, I think is relevant, is what is good without proof? In other words, what do we as a society at the moment accept is good without proof? Um, so we mentioned a couple of things, maybe curing a patient of a disease might be considered to be something that is good without proof. Although arguably you would say, if we, if we bring in the ethical question, not in all circumstances, there may be circumstances where that isn't desired. But there are a couple of things I think we could argue are good without proof. The first would be a reduction in harms to patients. So these are things like what we call nosocomial infection, infections that people get in hospital. In the past, we concentrated on MRSA, on Clostridium difficile. Recently, we've really been thinking about how to prevent hospital-acquired infection of COVID. Um, so I think everybody would accept that an intervention which led to a reduction in harms to patients would be a good. We don't need to argue about whether that's a good. Um, you might need to consider whether it is still a good if it comes at a huge increased cost, and, and we can discuss that a bit later again as well. Another one, which is more controversial, would be equity and access to healthcare. So plenty of people, I'll state me included, would think that it is a good, uh, an accepted good, that improving equity of access to healthcare would be a good policy. Um, although you would have to be very careful that in improving equity and access to healthcare, you weren't decreasing the quality of the healthcare that you provided. No good making everyone able to access a rubbish service. So you have to maintain that access. But these are the kind of things that I think can be good without proof. So what is the role of a clinician in empirical ethics? Clearly, I think they're important. I have a vested interest in thinking they're important, um, but I also am very keen to encourage our current uh, band of medical students and clinicians to get involved in challenging the premises of how they work. So the first thing is to spot the ethical problems which might be hidden from others. Medicine is more open than it was 10 or obviously 50 years ago, but there's still an awful lot that goes on behind closed doors. And a lot of the ethical problems in clinical practice really can only be spotted by those working in it. And one of the ways they can spot them is by saying, what are the areas of moral discomfort? What is it that when, when working, you think, oh, I wish we didn't have to do it this way, or I hate the fact that I have to say that to a patient, or I have to send that patient home in that context, or even the con even the sentence, send that patient home, that's a really uncomfortable sentence that we use all the time. Maybe we should change our language a little bit. 
So what are the areas of moral discomfort for clinicians? Are there any what is called is ought gaps? So this is where clinicians know that there is a way that things ought to be done and there is a way that things are done, are ought gaps. And uh, they can maybe identify some of the reasons why there's that gap, but most of it is just accepted. This is just the way it is. And we know it should be done by this, but because of the context of which we're working, we're maybe understaffed, we're maybe and don't have enough time, we don't do things quite the way we ought to. And it's important to be able to identify those is ought gaps so we can then try and change things to mitigate against the uh, difficult problems that we have and try and reduce them so things are working the way they ought to. And finally then, clinicians, because they're right in the middle of it, can help develop and evaluate practical alternatives to the problems that are causing uh, moral discomfort or is ought gaps within the system. So in order to develop and evaluate practical alternatives, we need to ask why are things the way they are right now? Not just are things working well or working badly, but why is it that they're the way they are? Were they designed that way? Mostly not. Mostly, most of what we're working in wasn't designed to be in a particular way. Mostly they developed reactively. And then the critical question is, whose needs have they developed in reaction to? And I think it is part of the ethical imperative to ask which other people's needs should we be considering in whatever process it is we're looking at. So of course, these might be the needs of patients, of our nursing staff colleagues, of other clinical staff, of organizations. Uh, we had a very interesting set of discussions during the COVID pandemic where we had really good conversations among the different organizations across our patch, which didn't happen before and hope well, it will continue now that we have established these channels of communication, looking at each other's needs and populations. Um, so any, any, any local policy, any national policy should really be considering the needs of all of these groups. So to bring that all together, can we test what is the right thing to do? Well, we can if we have outcomes which are relevant and which are accepted to be good without proof. And by good without proof, I don't mean we don't need to still assess those outcomes. It's just we're happy that the outcomes are good. That we have reasonable methods to measure those outcomes. We talked about qualitative, quantitative health economics. And that we engage clinicians and others to identify and develop interventions. And then critically, that we consider all the stakeholders and the effects on them. So the next step of this, I think, is to then look to the philosophers for a framework of how we might involve all stakeholders, how we might think about what effects uh, any intervention has. And the philosopher, uh, many philosophers have tried to come up with just societies and the one that uh, my colleague Kat Cox and I are working on using is rules. So with apologies to any philosophers who are watching, this is going to be a two minute summary of what is an incredible body of work by rules, just to try and show how we're applying it to medicine. So rules argued that a just society could be created using a so called veil of ignorance. And apologies as well to those of you who already know all about this, but I'm still going to try and summarize it quickly. So a veil of ignorance is the idea that you have a kind of thought experiment where you take a whole bunch of people from society and you put them in a room and say, you need to design a just society and you don't know whether in the society you are going to be male or female, rich or poor, sick or well. And the idea is that if those people not knowing where they would be in society create a set of rules, those rules will be just because they will have taken into account all the different needs. Now, there are two further principles that Rawls uh, talks about. One is the difference principle. And this is that he says what he calls primary goods, which are the things that everybody needs to lead a, a, a free and happy life, food, water, but also opportunity. Um, any primary good should be distributed equally. And where it can't be distributed equally, it should be distributed so that those in more need have more of it, essentially. And the just savings principle, is one really about considering future generations and making sure that we save some of our resource in order that the future uh, institutions will also be just. So if we take this veil of ignorance difference principle and just savings principle and then apply it to healthcare, and if you say, well, let's really shake up the way healthcare is designed. If you didn't know if you were patient, doctor, nurse, relative, manager, in this generation or in the next, what would the healthcare service look like? And the answer is quite different from the one we have now. 
So that's kind of on a meta level to think about rather than just bumbling along, reacting to the loudest voices, how could we think about reconsidering the whole healthcare service? But um, two of the main kind of theories that come from that, or two of the main principles, sorry, that come from that are that the healthcare service that we would end up with would be one where being sustainable was at the center of policy, which would have a massive impact on how we make decisions about training and treatment of staff. Um, and it would encourage research and innovation. And it would also be very open because one of the principles is that you must have opportunity and therefore policies would need to protect the powers and opportunities of those using the health service. And uh, a lot of the ways that we work right now really minimize the powers and opportunities of those using the health service. So those are, those are two main principles that I think would be different if we were considering how to restructure structure the health service, not that we want another restructure, but certainly in designing new policies. So that's all a little bit hypothetical. Um, and there are lots of immediate questions that need to be asked in policy making. And Kat Cox and I have recently had a paper accepted where we combine rules with Scanlon. So Scanlonian contractualism argues that just principles could be derived from debate among actual debate, not hypothetical debate among stakeholders. stakeholders to find solutions which others could not reasonably reject. And so in practice, this might mean that you assembled a real group of representatives and advocates of all the different people who would be affected by policy and asked them to discuss the policy that had been proposed and develop those which couldn't be reasonably rejected by any group. And then you would have kind of an ethical checklist where you use the Rawlsian derived principles of sustainability, equity, and openness. So this is a way that we think that you could address conflicting demands as they come to a health service. And very briefly, um, I'd like to think about how this might have been able to help policy making in a time of COVID. So nursing homes, we can argue that nursing home staff would have reasonably rejected the idea that patients were sent back to them from hospitals without having COVID swab testing. I think we could argue that medical staff and perhaps the population in general might have reasonably rejected a huge amount of resource going into Nightingale hospitals for potential intensive care beds, which is obviously at the extreme end of, of sickness of COVID, where that resource could instead perhaps have been put into uh, admissions units with separate side rooms where you could prevent nosocomial infection, hospital acquired infection. And relatives would probably have reasonably rejected the uh, policies on the blanket policies on not visiting dying patients and, and perhaps thought of new policies in order to be able to prevent infection spread while still maintaining important relationships at the end of life, which unfortunately were lost in the last few months. So I have to admit that this uh, approach, this rules Scanlonian approach is not yet tested. And so it isn't really a full case study um, of it's more how theoretical ethics could be applied to policy. So it's, it's just uh, two, two parts of the Venn diagram. Um, but now I will turn to a full case study with all three parts of the Venn diagram. Um, and perhaps uh, the alumni festival might invite me back in a few years if I've had a chance to assess how this approach works. So the case study that I'm gonna talk about is about resuscitation decisions. And it's how we've gone from a generally national policy of do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation to a many, many places adopting the RESPECT process. RESPECT stands for Recommended Summary Plan for Emergency Care and Treatment, and all will become clear at the end. But I'm going to take you right back to the history of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And I should say, actually, before I launch into this, if anyone has any questions they want to write now about the first half of the talk about the idea of philosophy policy and um, whether you can test whether something is good before I give you this example please do write them and then I'll continue to write questions about about this half of the talk too. So the history of CPR cardiopulmonary resuscitation was first introduced in the 1960s and it was actually mostly in surgical theatres obviously with patients who were generally quite well um, just needing an operation and anaesthetized and had a specific reversible thing which had stopped their heart and as a result it had a very high success rate. So to start with the assumption that every treatment but of course this changed quickly because unfortunately everybody does eventually die and the heart stopping is the final common pathway for all of us and if the heart has stopped because it is the final stage of the overall dying process, either because 
somebody has a cancer or somebody has an organ failure, their kidney or their heart is failing, or just because they're really frail and really old and their body is worn out, not that that's a very medical term, but that is what happens fortunately to some people. Then attempting to restart the heart isn't going to uh, reverse the overall dying process. And so it's not going to work. And so it was established that we should have some way of writing, do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And first of all, this was a bit of a secret code. So people would put a little heart in the notes or stars on the board, or 222 is the number you call for the resuscitation team. So they would write not for twos and um, put big red marks all around it. But in 1991, the UK ombudsman upheld a complaint that this was a really opaque uh, process. And the first do not resuscitate orders followed. And I like to say that do not resuscitate is the acronym that loved to get longer because it went from do not resuscitate to do not attempt resuscitate to show that it wasn't often successful. And then do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation to emphasize that it's just cardiopulmonary resuscitation that should be withheld and not, for example, fluid resuscitation. And if you keep on going along this track, you end up with Dunnak po watirakurasuar awatsubuga, which is do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation unless there is a clear reversible cause or, or a shockable rhythm, all other treatments should be given. And clearly that's a bit of a mouthful. So the note, the form is in the notes, often in red. And for those of you who haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. Um, and it's in the front of the notes and it's in red, so that in an emergency situation, the clinical staff can see it quickly and know not to attempt CPR. So there were two stories. We I talked at the beginning about this idea of, of moral discomfort. And there were two stories that really influenced me in terms of setting out to, to do this work. And the first was I was getting a handover um, at a district general hospital. I'd gone in for the night and I said, are there any sick patients? I want to know who I should review. And the outreach nurse who was in charge of making sure they're aware of which sick patients there are said, well, there are, but they all, they're all DNAR. And I looked at him in horror and said, I still need to go see those patients because obviously DNAR should just mean you're not going to restart the heart, shouldn't mean that you're not going to go and try and stop their heart from stopping if they're deteriorating from something. And my registrar colleague, the outgoing colleague, um, said DNAR, that means doesn't need another review. And he was joking. He was very witty. Uh, but there was just this little bit of truth in it and this little bit of recognition that there was this is ought gap that of course, we knew DNAR ought to mean only don't restart the heart if it stops, but that actual practice was that there was this unofficial triage and that patients with do not attempt resuscitation orders were getting less care, less treatment, perhaps less care as well than others. So the second patient, the second, the second story was um, I'd actually changed hospital. It was on a Friday night and I had a very competent, very alert, very frail, hardly any muscle mass on her, independent, I think she was 89 or 91 lady, who came in with a pneumonia. And she was sick enough that she was in the resus area of uh, A&E, and we were giving her antibiotics, we were giving her fluids, we were giving her all the treatment she needed. Um, but it was clear to me that if this wasn't working and her heart should stop, trying to restart it wouldn't be successful in her because it would be she would just have succumbed and her muscle mass wouldn't be enough to get her through the long period of intensive care that would be needed after that. Because unfortunately, when you attempt to restart the heart, you don't sit up and have a cup of tea, you then are intubated, you're ventilated, you go to um, the normal time before you can either it's realized that you're dying and you die or, um, or you're, you, you come out and you have a long period of rehabilitation at home. So I didn't think that would be um, what this person wanted. This was um, before the law changed, and we had to discuss. Uh, really had to discuss CPR discussions with everyone, and the culture at the time was that you wouldn't discuss them because it was concerned. It was a concern that that would cause harm, um, and I was very worried that if I made this, wrote one of these DNA CPRs on this lady, that she wouldn't get the care she needed to get her through the weekend. Um, and make sure that if she was getting a little bit sick as she went, for example, to intensive care for uh, 24 hours to let the antibiotics work. So I took this red form and I wrote all over it, not for CPR, but for consideration of intensive care, for doctor seeing her overnight, for blah, blah, blah. And I thought this red form is too blunt an instrument for what it is we need to do. 
So essentially there were ethical issues noted clinically, both moral discomfort, my moral discomfort. I felt sick every time I filled in one of these red forms because I was concerned that it was having more impact on the patient than I wanted and an identification of is ought gaps. So what to do? Well, the first thing to do was synthesize the existing evidence that various other people had collected and just make sure this wasn't just me being a little bit nervous in my registrar job. And um, turns out there was quite a lot wrong with DNA CPRs and what it needed was synthesizing. So the first was that they weren't routinely completed. Uh, there were some areas where patients would have CPR discussions or decisions made as soon as they came into hospital. And there were others where they were only considered uh, at the, you know, if they became very, very sick. And as a result, there were a lot of inappropriate resuscitations attempted. And you might say, well, what is an inappropriate resuscitation attempt? If it doesn't work, the patient's died and it doesn't matter. Um, but there is an inappropriate resuscitation attempt. And that is where you try a resuscitation attempt. If it works briefly, the patient comes around and then dies. And then they have been deprived of their quiet, peaceful, painless death and suddenly have a very traumatic end. And unfortunately, I have seen that happen and many of my colleagues have seen it happen. And it is something we want to protect patients from. Nobody liked discussing CPR. So I alluded to the fact that I hadn't discussed it with this, this lady back in early 2000s. And um, doctors didn't like discussing it because going up to a patient and saying, oh, by the way, we're not going to try and restart your heart wasn't uh, a very positive thing to say. And it was against our kind of, we're going to try and make you better ethos that we've all been had drummed into us. And patients didn't like bringing it up either. So as a result, about 50% of DNA CPRs weren't discussed at all. And in 2014, there was a law case brought to court and um, the Court of Appeal in the end, where it was proven that it was, it was judged that it was against someone's human rights not to discuss uh, a decision to withhold CPR um, because it was depriving them of the opportunity to ask questions about it, to ask for a second opinion. And since then, uh, and a following case of, of Winsphere where you must discuss it if the patient lacks capacity, you must discuss it with those close to them. Um, there was a legal imperative to discuss CPR. But at the point that I started this research, it wasn't happening and that was morally uncomfortable. And there were quite a few more issues. So um, as had been suggested by this nurse and handover, they were misunderstood to mean that other treatments shouldn't be given. And it turned out that a whole batch of clinicians had done research where they showed there was an actual difference in care from someone who had a DNA CPR and someone who didn't. And these were good studies where they controlled for all the different variables. And then there were other scenario studies that were done, um, which I guess is a kind of quantitative evidence in and of itself, where they would write two different stories that would be identical about a patient, except one would have a line saying they have a DNA CPR. And they would ask the nurses and doctors to make decisions about what treatments they would give these patients. And uh, the, 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 the story that had a DNA CPR, both nurses and doctors would report that they would give many fewer treatments to these patients independent of the DNA CPR. So it looked like do not resuscitate orders were being conflated with these patients are dying, leave them alone. Um, and that was absolutely not the case. Many patients with do not resuscitate orders were being discharged from hospital um, and it did not, it absolutely shouldn't have been conflated with end of life. And then this, this picture is a variation in approach. There were huge numbers, different numbers of DNA CPR orders, and so different people had different forms. So step two was to find out what different service users and providers' needs were. And as advertised at the beginning of this talk, we did qualitative research, we did interviews, we did focus group, we did ethnography, we did quantitative, which was questionnaires, and it was also an observational study looking at harms to patients. And we integrated that with the ethical questions and we reanalyzed. So uh, we then developed a new approach to meet those needs and address the ethical issue raised. And thinking about what might be wanted from this new approach, it was to improve care for those in whom a decision not to resuscitate had been made, to remove the kind of stigma of DNA CPR and the ad hoc nature of consideration. It was to focus on the treatments to be given rather than one to withheld because in discussion we recognized that one of the reasons people hated having these discussions was because it was so nihilistic. It was about do not resuscitate. Whereas actually the conversation that we as doctors wanted to be having and we hoped patients and their relatives wanted to be having was what are we trying to achieve with these treatments? What do you want? What is it that we can do for you? And what is it that you're scared of? And we won't do the things that are going to end up 
doing things that are bad for you. But let's not just waltz in with a conversation about what we're not going to do. Let's focus on the treatments to be given rather than on one to be withheld. And let's encourage forward thinking, still maintaining really clear emergency instruction if the patient deteriorates. So that was a massive uh, set of wishes. And we still also wanted to keep it all on one piece of paper to maintain this clarity. And so we set out to develop an approach. We used an iterative approach, kind of modified Delphi model. We involved a behavioral economist and we addressed ethical issues at each point. So for example, there was one point in which a suggestion was made that we should have lots of tick boxes for lots of different treatments. And um, that was concerned that we might then reduce the amount of things that people had because they would be confused by all the tick boxes. There'd be too many discussions and we should keep it very much as an overall goal of care. So this was what we got to back in, I've actually lost track of dates now, I don't know, 2016 or something. And this was called the UFDO, Universal Form of Treatment Options. It was named by, by patients in a focus group. And very briefly, the idea was that you would, instead of making a decision about CPR and going and getting the red form, which is what we did, you would pick up for everybody one of these green forms, this is in hospital. You would make sure you had information about the patient situation. And in discussion with the patient, you would establish whether your overall goal of care was active treatment to get them better or op optimal supportive care to try and make them feel better. If they were for optimal supportive care, then obviously they were not for resuscitation. These were patients who are dying at the end of their life and we needed to make sure that we gave them good palliative care. If they were for active treatment, then there was a whole range of things that could be appropriate for them. It could be absolutely appropriate that they would go to intensive care, like my little old lady, and have uh, invasive ventilation for one or two days while her antibiotics work. But if it didn't work, then you wouldn't attempt CPR. And it was also very possible that in conversation you would realise that CPR was absolutely the right thing for this patient, that they were happy with whatever outcomes came. So this was kind of a, a paradigm shift in that instead of just talking about CPR, we were always going to talk about goals of care. So we tested it. And again, we used mixed methods. So we used qualitative interviews. And this is just a little bit of the kind of data that we had. Essentially, it provided a sense of forward planning and made, patient, made, made us question where we were going with the patient from the beginning, um, provided more clinical comfort with the decision. So got rid of some of the moral discomfort that doctors are feeling. And um, it made sure that uh, the, the whole process of discussing these things was normalized. Critically, we did a quantitative assessment and um, we looked at the number of harms using an international healthcare improvement score. And we did a before and after study uh, with contemporaneous case controls. So essentially, we, we looked at a DNA CPR period in two areas. We then introduced UFTO, had a bedding in period. And then we had an UFTO period only on, on, on so we only introduced UFTO on, on two wards and on the other two we didn't. And we looked at the harm rate. These are things like hospital acquired infection, uh, pressure sores, uh, falls. And as you can see in the period from DNA CPR to UFTO, um, it massively uh, reduced. Um, and there was no change seen in the other wards. In fact, it went up slightly, which is what you would expect over the winter period. Um, so this was enough for, um, and, and because we'd done the qualitative work alongside the quantitative work, we had an idea of the mechanism of change. So we said, you know, UFTO contextualizes CPR within goals of, of care. And so it's led to a change in culture. Nurses, instead of talking about the patient in bed six, whose DNA CPR was talking about the patient in bed six, who has pneumonia, is for active treatment, but is not for CPR. So the discussion about the patients changed and it changed the reasoning and nature of discussions of patients. So we then looked at the ethical issues again. We felt reasonably pleased with ourselves and we decided we needed to disseminate this because we felt there was a, an ethical imperative to share this information, even though it was only in one hospital um, and, um, uh, and we had then synthesized evidence from lots of other hospitals. But we'll come back to the, the strength of evidence later because I think it's relevant. So we presented to the Health Select Committee. Um, I found that Gavin Perkins and Anne-Marie Slother were doing excellent work in Warwick on DNA CPR and we ended up collaborating together to uh, do an evidence synthesis um, presented the work to Resuscitation Council UK who is the charity that at that time made a kind of a, a standard DNA CPR order and produced guidance on resuscitation decisions 
and kind of went and courted lots of other stakeholders, the Royal College of Physicians, General Medical Council, etc. I always say that was my period of having nice biscuits and lots of cups of tea as I went and talked to all these people, but um, it was important. The Resuscitation Council UK have then been extraordinary and they basically said this is very important and they were willing to fund meetings of stakeholders from all over all four nations, from all specialities, from paediatrics through to geriatrics, from intensive care through to palliative care. We had patient representation, we had legal input. And we started iterating not only the work that I'd done on AFTO, but work that um, another alumna, Mick Mercer, had done down in Devon on something called TEP, um, work done in the Northeast, all, all of the places where best practice had been convened. And we started iterating so that we could have a process that wouldn't only work in hospitals, which is what Respect was designed for, but would work across, uh, across into community as well. Resource Council funded a full-time clinical lead and eventually launched what I'm about to show you and then have managed to uh, have managed the feedback from all of the institutions. So this is Respect, the recommended summary plan for emergency care and treatment. And this is actually version three, which is actually probably version 360, but the official version three that was launched the day before yesterday. And I said the paradigm shift to UFTA was to make sure that CPR was always contextualized within goals of care. Well, the paradigm shift with Respect was to make absolutely sure that uh, the discussion was all about establishing shared understanding between the patient and the clinician. So what's involved is the first thing is that the patient and the clinician establish a shared understanding of the patient's health and their current condition. And then a shared understanding of what the patient most values and what the patient most fears. And with that information, with the information that the clinician has then got from the patient about what they most value and what they most fear, they make clinical recommendations about which treatments are most likely to result in those outcomes. So they can say, well, because you've told me that what you most value is your independence and what you most fear is a lingering death, which is actually something I have heard many times and not, not just picking those at random, I would say that we should give you all the treatments that we could on the ward. Um, and uh, if you needed it, you know, you could consider going to intensive care for a brief period. But if your heart was to stop, I would suggest that that would not um, match that, that that potentially would lead to having a lingering death. And so I would say that that is not going to be the best thing for you. If you have someone who says what I most value is um, just being able to recognize my grandchildren and I don't care if I'm bed bound forever, then you can say, OK, well, actually, I think we just need to prioritize extending life. And we will write down this in your own words. And if you're ever to deteriorate to the point that you weren't recognizing your grandchildren, we would change tack. And um, I always recommend that uh, clinicians write exactly in quotes what, these, what, what people want here. So you record recommendations in a readily recognized format. And then you, just as the bottom red corner, you make a CPR decision in the context of overall goals of care. So adoption of respect is now widespread and um, there's 120 trusts across the country and counting. And I thought this was a good case study because it kind of integrated the things that I wanted to talk about. So we recognized an ethical problem, gathered empirical evidence, developed an alternative in collaboration with patients and stakeholders. We presented it to policymakers and it happened in tandem with legal changes. So the last question I want to ask is when does empirical evidence of harm lead to an ethical imperative to change practice? And with respect, there was definitely enough evidence to develop change. There was definitely enough evidence to facilitate and encourage change. I believe we still need more patient involvement and perhaps some of you can get in touch with me later as non-medics and members of the public to try and help encourage patient and public involvement. And um, we're still collecting evidence to make sure it doesn't do unintended harm. You know, I talked about those counterbalances, so we're doing that at the moment. Um, and as we continue to iterate it to so this new version, we've addressed aspects which could be reasonably rejected by some people. More generally, I think a policy can and should be changed. This has been evidence to cause harm when an alternative would not be reasonably rejected by those it affects. And then you should take the alternative and it's not good enough to just say, oh, we've got a new one. You then need to evaluate it, iterate it and keep listening. My belief, and I don't know if this is naive, happy to answer questions on it, is where possible, 
policies should be adopted voluntarily rather than through mandate and incentives because when you force someone to take something on their interest in the outcomes isn't as great and the thing that i think i've been most pleased about with respect is that without any incentive um uh, clinicians and patients have recognized they have seen it as a good without proof that it improves the conversation that it improves patient experience and they've been willing to take it on across um, many areas um uh, Although we, we obviously, sorry, I'm slightly contradicting myself there in that we had proof and um, the good without proof was that it reduced patient, the good without proof was that a reduction in harms was a good enough thing to do. Um, so other areas of clinical practice which are being questioned by my colleagues and me are how we refer and accept uh, patients to intensive care, how we provide information to patients in hospitals, withdrawal of clinically assisted nutrition and hydration in those with prolonged disorders of consciousness and currently doing a big project about how we share uncertainty in diagnosis and how much we should tell patients routinely about what we're thinking about in terms of what their diagnosis is before we are sure. So I hope I have shown that empirical ethics can provide evidence and process for good policy making and this was the Venn diagram I put up at the beginning and I'm hoping that you now um, uh, agree with me that it's actually ethics is a huge bit of clinical practice and that this area in the Venn diagram that I am interested in where ethics meets scientific research meets policy is, is ripe for many more people to come and join me and um, find out what areas we need to look at. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I would like to explicitly thank my colleagues uh, who did a lot of the work on respect, Alexandra Mallion, Jonathan Fold, and we slow the Gavin Perkins, to Kat Cox, who's done the work with Rules and Scan and me, and NIHR, the Wellcome Trust, and the Resuscitation Council. Okay, thank you very much. Now I think I meant to remind you that the event has been recorded and will be uploaded onto our dear world. And I think I stop share and hopefully someone, I can see the question and answers. Excellent. Good. Okay. Uh, so, um, it's very strange reading questions and not hearing them and not seeing, um, what's going on. So, um, I think I just need to read them out loud, I'm afraid. And, um, and then I think I'm saying answer live. So Marius has said, uh, do you think DNA CPR should be a blanket discussion with each patient, e.g. on admission, or only if they deteriorate? How do you think the new respect form may address some of the ethical issues you have raised on withholding active treatments? Okay, so I think the term blanket discussion is, is a little bit uh, it makes me a little bit nervous because obviously there were a lot of blanket DNA CPRs, uh, DNA CPRs written during COVID in care homes. Um, and the whole thing about both about resuscitation decisions and respect is that it has to be an individualized discussion. However, I think what you are, so I, I reject the term blanket, but if what you're saying is it should it be routine? Yes, I think it should be routine. And that's what we have instituted in Cambridge. Um, and the reason for that is to try and destigmatize the conversation. Um, we give people, well, we have been trying to give people patient information leaflets, it's certainly all on the internet, um, about expecting this conversation. And actually in the last two or three years, we've seen a massive culture change where people recognize that when they come into hospital, they're going to have a discussion about it. And by making it routine and by getting over the kind of hump of, oh, this is quite a scary conversation to have on admission, it has prompted people and their families to go away perhaps after that first admission and have about it um, have more of a discussion about their overall goals of care are and then have a documentation or perhaps then speak to their GP so that they can uh, continue to develop their own form and make sure that it properly represents what they want. Your second bit of your question was how do you think the new respect form addresses some of the ethical issues you raised on withholding active treatments? Well we saw that in so I mean respect obviously is but in after we did have quantitative um, evidence that it it addressed it, and the reason it addressed it it to be a sub subliminally telling people not to not to do extra things. The respect form forces you to say this person is for active treatment, and um, they are for um, they are for all of these treatments 
And so it give, empowers the nurse when they're phoning the doctor to say, the patient's for active treatment, but not for resuscitation, please come and see them. It empowers the junior doctor when they're phoning ICU to say the patient is for consideration of ICU. So we have seen a difference. And in fact, we repeated the um, vignette experiment with UFTO as a third option. And uh, the, the reported behavior of doctors and nurses changed. So they gave patients appropriate treatment. Okay. Um, Peter, La Peter has asked me, if you strongly suspect that a patient has a serious condition, should you tell them at once, only when it is confirmed or even not at all? So I think this is an excellent question. Um, and I think it depends on the, the probability of it being a serious condition and how long it will take you to find out about it. So for example, I had a patient in A&E who probably had gallstones, but might have had pancreatic cancer, a very serious condition. Um, I knew I would have the answer to that within a few hours. And um, I decided for her that I was going to do the ultrasound and the blood tests and that I was going to say, I don't know what's causing it. be quite a few things. I'm going to do an ultrasound and some blood tests to try and we should know in a few hours. Had she said to me, what exactly do you think it is? Obviously, I would have told her, but I left it hanging like that. And she was quite happy that I was going to do the investigations and let her know. And I, I felt that that was the right line. If you are going to have to do an investigation, which is going to take some time or obviously is invasive, then I think you have to explain why you're doing it. Um, and you've written or even not at all. Um, so I don't think there's ever, I don't think there's a situation where you wouldn't tell a patient about a serious condition. David is from Ontario, Canada, which is where I was born. Uh, hello, David. Um, can you say what the practice is outside the UK? Well, I can't say where it is internationally, uh, everywhere. I can say that um, it is varied in Canada and there are some places that are using something like respect. Um, I would be keen to come back home and talk about respect in Ontario. I don't know what the answer is there, sorry. Um, Hilary says, how do you apply the views expressed in respect in a situation of resource shortages and at the height of COVID? How do clinicians ration scarce resources? Well, uh, this is an excellent question. And uh, the views expressed in respect are about the the outcomes and fears, the, the, the values and fears that a patient um, sorry, that, that are first of all about making sure you understand what the patient values and what they fear, and then making a recommendation for that patient. Fortunately, at the height of the COVID pandemic, in our practice, we never got to a situation where we were having to say to patients, even though I think this might work for you to get you to the outcomes you value, we can't give it to you because there's another patient over there that has a better chance. We were all very scared that that was going to happen. Unfortunately, it didn't. Um, what we would like, what I would like, is not for the individual clinician to have to be rationing scarce resources, but for the government and um, for the moral advisory group, that moral and ethical advisory group that they have, to give us a framework in which to do that. Um, the, I helped work with the NICE and the um, Royal College of Physicians to develop some kind of toolkit to be able to help clinicians do this. And it includes looking at what the likelihood of survival was going to be. So everyone talked a lot about the fear of, of not having enough ventilators and the prognostic, um, the, the, the factor which was most likely to mean that someone didn't survive on a ventilator was frailty. And so that was able um, to be used. Um, but I guess the, the crux of what you're asking is what, or I'm, I'm guessing, I'm sorry, it's very hard in a one way conversation. I think the crux of what you're asking is what if a patient wants a particular treatment and there isn't enough resource available for that? Um, and I, uh, if we go back one step, what if a patient wants a particular treatment and you, the clinician, don't think they would benefit from it? Well, then legally, the patient doesn't have the right to demand treatment, but your job as a clinician is to get a second opinion and make sure that you are um, not alone in thinking that this patient wouldn't benefit from it. And then you need to try and explain to the patient why you think this treatment wouldn't 
benefit from them. Um, but as I say, the situation of a treatment that you think they would benefit from, but there just isn't enough of, uh, fortunately, we haven't had to deal with on a personal level. And I think that's the kind of thing that needs to be discussed nationally in this kind of rules scanlan way, so that everybody is in agreement that this is the kind of process we would use. It's not fair to patients or to clinicians to leave it down to individual discussions and decisions. And then you will end up with massive variation across the country as well. Um, could you give an example, Jean says, could you give an example of reasonable objections people have raised against the change from DNA CPR to respect? Uh, yes, so um, the reasonable objection was it's gonna take too long. So lots of doctors, when we started UFTO, not respect, were like, oh my God, you want me to fill in this whole form and have this whole conversation. This is going to have a massive impact on other things that we should be doing. Um, and if a patient isn't gonna survive CPR, then really do we need to have a conversation about all these other things was a, I think, I mean, it was certainly a very loud objection. What was interesting was that ultimately when those ideas were put up against patients' views of actually, we'd really like to have these discussions, please. Um, clearly that won. And so uh, that, that we, we have respect and not DNA CPR, um, but we've continued to iterate it in order to make it a more patient-centered. Um, thank you for the people saying thank you. I'm not going to read those out loud because that just feels a bit... Uh, <laughs> um, so Robert asks, uh, my question is whether you have persuaded the hospice organizations to accept this approach. Yes, lots of hospices are using respect. I don't know nationally. I know locally and um, I think across Cambridge they are. Um, Annabelle has asked, can you talk about the use of respect earlier and more proactively in the community? and do 111999 and ambulance crews know about it. So absolutely respect is now spreading into the community and should be being used more proactively. I think it's gonna take another five years or so. And I think the next thing we need is real patient and public engagement in this. Patients saying we would like our respect discussion early. Um, and as I said before, if anyone wants to get in touch with me and get involved, then that would be great. Yes, one, uh, I don't know about 111 actually, but 999 and ambulance clinicians definitely know about respect. Um, there is a problem in terms of its digital adoption, which is in line with, there is no national program for IT as everybody knows. So we don't have yet a solution for how everybody can see what's on a respect form, but hopefully that will come. Um, Caroline has asked if a doctor and patient disagree on the level of care that should be attempted in the case of respect who has the final decision. So in the law in the UK, a patient can't demand treatment. They can state they don't want treatments, but, um, uh, sorry, I got distracted by the question. Um, if a doctor and patient, if a, if a patient can't demand treatment, they can only say they don't want treatments, but a, uh, they absolutely have the right to challenge the decision that's being made, to ask for a second opinion and to continue to discuss it. Um, my own personal experience is in general, having this discussion where you're talking about overall goals of care, where you're really trying to understand uh, what the patient is wanting. I personally haven't had any disagreements with patients. Um, I think it's a very different scenario if you're going to a patient saying we aren't going to attempt CPR. Um, you Someone said, you said your project happened in tandem with legal changes. Surely you need to add another circle. I think you're right. And in fact, I'm doing that uh, now with colleagues in the law faculty. Um, so, um, oh, someone else from Canada, New Brunswick. My sister was at university there. Uh, Kamen says, in the event there was a government provided or other central framework for decisions for allocation of scarce resources, how would that assist? It might narrow the scope of the doctor's discretion or structure the ethical inquiry, but will it ensure a better quality ethical decision and how? Um, that's probably too broad a question for me to answer well in my remaining few minutes, but I think it has to do with, so if my, my the theory is if you took a Rawlsian approach to how you would do this and you made sure you were thinking about everybody that would be affected, then you would make sure you were coming up with equitable uh, answers. 
too much, but I think you do want to narrow it a lot because you don't want every single doctor and patient to be going through the same, uh, having to take the emotional and work burden of those decisions because A, it will lead to too much inequity across regions and B, actually we have a duty to protect our doctors. So there's a sustainability issue as well. It is not a comfortable thing to do and we need to have some structure on which to do it. Um, so um, Faye has said, in research ethics, participants often give permission for future research to be done. Um, how confidential is the information obtained? I'm sorry, I don't think I can answer this one. I shouldn't have read it. It was about last night's webinar, apologies. Um, and another question is, you mentioned the insights of philosophy in regard questions of medical ethics. Oh. Uh, would you see a role for religious perspectives in these discussions? For instance, in hospital settings, chaplains could be a helpful resource for providing this input. I ask this as an Anglican priest. Well, I, I think all, all views are important and um, religious philosophical views are important. My own personal view, and interestingly, um, it, is that it, everybody, everybody is allowed to have their philosophical insights and their readings from which they take them. And I don't know that the religious perspectives should have primacy over the other ones. That's my personal view, but certainly they should be um, consulted. And we in fact have a chaplaincy representation on our ethics group. Um, so there are some really long questions and I've only got two minutes left. <laughs> um, so there are, so I'm just looking for more ones. Um, so Jean asks another question. Have you ever had a patient who was uncertain about what they valued most and what they feared most? What would you do in this case? Yes, I have definitely in patients who aren't expecting to have these conversations, in which case you just don't hurry them. So this isn't necessarily, I mean, one of the advantages of having it on admission is that you can say, I'm just starting this conversation now. If you've never thought about it, we don't need to complete this form right now. Um, we need to, um, we need to, you can take this information sheet and you need to go and have a discussion with your family and we need to come back to this another time. Um, I, I also do sometimes give examples. So some of the phrases I've said, I say, if someone says, what do you mean? What do I fear most? I might use the examples I've talked about. Um, and um, Catherine says, understandably, the focus has been on the hospital context. I feel that given the current impact of COVID-19 on the more limited services by GPs, the benefits of implementation would be invaluable for those being cared for at home. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. As I say, it's just a little bit easier to introduce something across a hospital setting, but it has already been introduced in primary care settings and hospices and in care homes in many places in the UK. And actually some regions have done it more successfully. They've started off in the community and gone into the hospital. Um, someone says, can participants be emailed with details? Uh, I'm very happy to say my, my Cambridge email, which is at the back at the bottom is Z for Zoe, B for Bendict, M for McCourt, F for Fritz, ZBMF2 at cam.ac.uk. Very happy to be contacted. Um, and that, I think, is the end of this. Uh, <laughs> it's quite hard doing these questions and reading them and answering them at the same time. <laughs> not having the interaction. I hope I've done okay. It has been a pleasure talking to you all and um, thank you for all the great questions. <laughs>